One thing I'll say to people that are, that are interested in pl- working in the global health space or the public health space is this. You will be saving lives. So when you get up in the morning, you're having a bad day, you're tired, you know, y- y- your work is being feeling a little bit dull. You're saving lives. You just don't know who those lives are because public, the word, when public health works, it translates into things that don't happen. People that don't get exposed, people that don't get sick, people that don't land up in the hospital putting pressure on the acute hospital system. So the work you're doing is saving lives. You just don't know who those lives are. Those people don't know that you've saved their lives, and so they don't know to thank you. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. In the previous episode, Gordon, LaShawn, Will, and Linda welcomed Dr. Greg Martin, a medical doctor working as a specialist in public health medicine based in Ireland, about some important factors to consider when pursuing a PhD or DRPH. They also talked about some tips to make you stand out in an interview and how an MPH can add value to your public health or global health journey. In the second part of the discussion, they shift gears to discuss public health and global health jobs, careers, identifying areas of interest, and the global health landscape post-pandemic. This is where they left off. Transitioning from that, so there's a public health education, um, you, you, you get your public health degree, your global health degree, um, you're proud of yourself, your family's proud of you, your friends are happy, and now it's time for you to start thinking about what are you going to do after, you know, jobs, careers. So um, we know that you have a lot of experience in the global health space and, and public health as well. So how, what, are, what, are, what is the first steps when someone has finished um, their education and starts looking at, you know, employers, um, areas yeah. of interest, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so one of the most common questions that people ask as they finish an MBH is, how do I get that first job? Because most of the jobs ask for experience, and how do I get the experience without the job? It's that chicken and egg problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And everybody kind of has that. Uh, and, and, and it's actually not easy. I understand that it's difficult. Um, there's, a couple, there's, a, there's a couple of things that you can do around that. Firstly, if you take the, 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 you guys, for example, you're doing something outside of the context of formal employment. You've started a podcast and there's lots of things like that that people can do um, that you can clock that up as experience. You know what I mean? So when you guys are applying for jobs, you can say like I did a public health podcast for X number of years and managed it and we had a team and we did stuff and there was logistics and we had all sorts of operational issues and you can really talk about what you've done and you didn't need you know, you didn't have to get employed. You guys started this. And I think, so the one thing I'd encourage people to do is um, do, do what you can outside of the context of formal employment in, in terms of clocking up any kind of experience. And you could start a blog. You can, you know, I, I was once hiring someone to join my team when I was working at the WHO. And there was a couple of candidates and they all seemed very good. But the one person had in their own time started like a whole web page looking at access to medicines and that sort of thing which is the work we were looking at and i was like well this person's demonstrating like a deep interest in this in a personal way like this is her spare time that she's using to kind of get this web page up so this is more than just a job to this person and so we gave the role to her so the, the, the doing the sort of thing that you're doing right now actually matters it adds up I mean, it matters in terms of you having a great impact and you're doing a good thing, but it matters in terms of your own careers. This is experience that will really reflect well on you going forwards, believe me. Um, and I did, so I did a similar thing. I started the journal Globalization and Health. And, you know, when I apply for jobs, people sometimes have seen the YouTube channel, they ask me about it. So it's, you know, the, these things re- land up being useful to, for having done. Okay, that's the one thing. The second thing you can do is, and this depends on the extent to which you can afford to do some work without getting paid, but you can do some volunteer work Mm -hmm. and that might translate into other opportunities. Increasingly, there is, um, there are internships that you can do that you get paid for. So, um, uh, you can do an internship, for example, at the WHO. Now, WHO internships didn't used to get paid. And I, I found that quite objectionable. And, and a few of us actually wrote kind of a, a sternly worded letter saying that this is ridiculous because what it meant was internships at the WHO 
only were were filled, those positions were only filled by people that came from wealthy families mm. that could afford to send their children to live in Geneva, a very, very expensive city yeah. for three to six months. You know, and if you were from a low middle income country, there was, there's you know, no. and, and didn't have that kind of resource, there's no way you could do that. And what is the point? Like the WHO should be having interns from all over the world going back into their countries, strengthening those relationships mm-hmm. and interconnections. So now the WHO does provide a stipend and I think it's quite, quite a healthy one. So, and like UNICEF would do the same, the World Bank probably the same. So a lot of those bigger organizations would provide paid internships. So that that's something else that you can do. And the final thing you can do in terms of getting experience without getting a job is you can do consulting work. And that's, I talked about consulting work a little bit earlier and I'll just circle back on that quickly now. There's probably more consulting work opportunities out there than you would think, but people find it difficult to know how to find the consulting work. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, people on the other end of that equation find it difficult to find the consultants. Mm -hmm. It's weird. But I mean, when I was looking, when I was wanting to do consulting work, I was like, I don't know where to start looking. Where do you even start looking for consulting work? And I remember when I was working at the WHO, people were like, we need consultants. Where do we find them? We don't know where to find them. So there's (laughs) almost like a dating game that needs to happen here. Like like a swipe left. All of the swiping story. Let's go. We need that. I don't even know how the swiping story works. It didn't exist when I was young and single. But I think whatever you guys, young people do with the swiping on the phones, (laughs) we need to do that with, uh, with consultants and consultant vacancies. And I've been talking about this for years. We need to create like a dating mm-hmm. web- website mm-hmm. because on both sides of the equation, everybody's looking for them, but there's no, it's just that conversation's not being facilitated. There's no, no one's helping these people talk to each other, but there's certainly, like if you're a good consultant at the WHO, your CV gets emailed around left, right and center. Wow. Like people are hungry for good consultants. The other thing to keep in mind about consulting work is people often think, oh, consulting work, and they think of strategy consulting, like McKinsey and company, like they'd swoop in and give you a 10 year strategy. Most mm. consulting work is like bread and butter work that just the organization needs some horsepower. Mm. Somebody's gone on leave or left the organization and there's a gap and they need somebody to help. They need an extra pair of hands. They don't need you to be a super duper expert. They, they just need a human being that's bright that can engage and quickly get up to speed with what they're doing and help them get something over the line. And there's lots of that kind of work out there. Now, um, how do you get it? It's You've got to network like crazy, okay, at the moment, like in lieu of the dating service that we're going mm-hmm. to put together. Um, you, the way to do it is you've got to network like crazy. And how do you do that? Use things like LinkedIn. Use email people that you know. Work through academia. Your professors ask them if they know somebody that works at the place you want to work. And then you, you kind of have to do a little bit of cyber stalking. Okay, and here, this is what I mean by that. I'll give you an example. Um, uh... There was someone I, 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 when I was at, years ago, there was somebody that I, I, I wanted to get in touch with. I, I, I saw this person as a, co- a contact that I may want to talk to about career opportunities. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I, I, I looked up a paper that he had written and very often the corresponding author's email address is available. So, mm-hmm. okay, so this is, I'm just, there's a little bit of stalking here, but like, okay, now I know I can get in front of this person. I can get into their inbox, right? Now, you can get into someone's inbox and you can either be annoying or you can get their attention. So this is how you get their attention. Firstly, you, the email you send, super short, like super short, like so short that they need to be able to read the entire thing at a glance. Because, like, And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying this. I get people that sort of find me online and they'll find my email address and they'll send me an email about, you know, they, they're looking for a work in global health. And uh, more often than not, their email is like a three page long description of their entire childhood and why this <laughs> is important to them and they're going to be the best person ever. And can I tell you something about my inbox at the moment? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a person that reads manages my inbox i don't even read my emails anymore wow. i've got a human being that reads all of my emails and fishes out the stuff that i have to see because if at the end of the day if i haven't seen it my world is going to fall apart right, right. so somebody from wherever that sent me a two-page long email about their childhood and how they really want to do this my executive assistant is not flagging that up for me to read 
Mm. Just that's because of where my life is at the moment. Like I'm not yeah. reading emails. You know, I've got and not not everybody's in that. Like I, that's just because my life at the moment is it's kind of totally mad and that's COVID related. <laughs> but even if it wasn't that mad, let's say I was back in my normal life where I'm actually reading my emails. I'm still not wanting to read two or three pages from some person that I've never met before, especially if I'm getting quite a few of those emails. You send a very short email, I'm going to read it right then. What how, what needs to be in that email? That email has got to have a question because that then I'm going to that you asking me to send an answer. Mm-hmm. And the question, you want to find a question that's got a short and easy answer, not like, can you please explain to me how to get a job in global health? Well, that's a whole conversation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and sometimes I actually had someone recently reach out to me through LinkedIn and they had some quite detailed questions, but I could see that they thought about this quite a lot. And I sent a reply and I said, the answer to that is too complicated to put into a message, but let's talk on the phone and we'll kick this around over the phone. And I actually, I spent this afternoon, I spent an hour on the phone with that person and I've done it. I'm never going to see them again in my life. And so people will make the time for you. If, if you, if you come up with a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to send a short question. Now, this is what you can do. You've read a paper that they've written. Um, you can ask them a question about something, their research. So don't be saying, have you got a job for me? Like <laughs> chances are at that point in time on that day, they probably don't have a job. For you. <laughs> you want to build up that relationship. So you want to say, I read a paper that you wrote, which was really interesting. And I just had a question about some, one of your research findings. Here's the question, bam, um, you know, kind regards, ba, 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 ba. They read that question, they're flattered. Hey, this person read my paper and they were interested and they asked like of course i'm going to answer that you know beep, 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 here's the answer now suddenly you're email buddies you you know what mm-hmm. i mean you're, you're, you weren't annoying you weren't asking them for a job you weren't sending a three-page thing short quick email and they sent it back and then leave them alone for a while like don't reply back don't try and have like become pen pals just like now we're in contact <laughs> then like in six months time you send another like follow-up hey how you doing just wanted to keep in touch you know i read another paper that you wrote i was really impressed mm-hmm. uh would you be interested in collaborating on a something or you know Mm -hmm. and you you don't just do that with one person you you like go wild like email loads of people like that and build up that professional network so important in those conversations you can mention listen by the way uh i'm available to do consulting work at the moment if you know of anything that's out there just that Mm. you can just slot that in there and you'll be surprised like you know so so, so the consulting work. Okay, the reason why consulting work is quite a nice thing to get into if you're if if you don't have a job and you, you're kind of like, well, what am I going to do? I'm kind of stuck for something to do. If you say I'm doing consulting work, even if you don't get much work, but you did it for six months, and even in that six months, you you only found a few little jobs here and there, and most of the time you're kind of like searching around, stalking people on the internet. Don't worry, because that means when you apply for the next job. And they say, what have you been doing? You've been like, well, I spent six months doing consulting work. So you weren't right. doing nothing. You know, uh, you, you're building up your CV, even if the even if the, you're doing small pieces of work and you weren't making a fortune in this, you know. So the consulting, but the consulting work, if you do get into that space, very often will lead to a job. So it's often a great stepping stone into an organization. To follow up on your, your comments about... Um kind of how to approach an email situation of jobs you're interested in and reaching out to your network. You mentioned that you you would prefer it to be as brief as possible and you talked about, you know, that fine-tuned brief question. Do you think that it's important for the individual to also have a couple sentences or a sentence to introduce themselves and where they're at in that kind of email? Yeah, I would you you create a bit of context definitely, but like keep it as short as possible. Um and you, and you can fill in some of the, the, the blanks in subsequent emails, but my, like out of everything about what goes into that email, your number one objective is to find a way of being brief. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I'm, I'm like, it's so perhaps take what I'm saying with a slight pinch of salt. So I'm quite badly dyslexic. So for <laughs> me, long emails are particularly annoying, but uh, mm-hmm. like that might not be the case for everybody. So maybe you know, take everything I say about long emails that a slight pinch of salt. <laughs> like if I get a long email, it, like I, it feels like I'm being stabbed in the eye with a pen. No, no, for um, sure. Like I've, I've heard that comment from a lot of people and um, I've worked with a lot of supervisors in the past and they said when students and, you know, career seekers are sending out emails and it's just a page long, they don't have the time realistically. They have their own jobs and responsibilities at their work. And um, okay, so we actually have a question from Instagram from uh, C-Day. And this individual is asking, 
What countries have the best jobs for global health and need the help the most? Wow. So yeah. there, there, there's, two, there's two sides to that. Glo- most global health organizations have a headquarters somewhere. And it, you, so you may want to be working in that environment or you might be wanting to work in the field at the sort of coalface and uh and then that's a very different set of countries okay so um if you're wanting to work at a headquarters and um you know countries that have got a lot of sort of global health organizations and a big presence would be kind of uh, geneva london washington dc and then and there's some academic institutions and sort of maybe san francisco and there's a couple of but some of those big cities um but even kind of relatively big cities like I came when I moved to Dublin there wasn't much mm-hmm. in terms of you know organizations that are involved in global health where you know I could look for because that's what my original plan when I moved to Dublin was oh, I'll just find a global health job here and um, and then I just got here and I was like oh hang on they, you know all the organizations that I'm used to working with don't have a presence here so that's but c- certainly like if in Geneva you can't throw a stone without hitting four people working in global health mm-hmm. there's like loads of global health in Geneva hundreds of organizations it's it's crawling with it um, I'll just quickly talk about Geneva while we're talking about location because mm-hmm. um, so j- jobs in Geneva pay very well so the salaries are, are great um, it's a very expensive city there's something about Geneva that um is very transient and everybody that's working there is there for a little while and then moves on and there's a lot of coming and going mm. and what that means is that it's not an easy place to feel as if this is home um, and so depending on where you are in your life that's an important thing to think about um, so I loved my time in Geneva but at no point while I was working there did I think I'm going to live here this is now the place that I live um, I always kind of thought I'm here for a couple of years and then I'm going to move on. So keep that in mind. Depending on where you are in your life, that that may be an important issue. You know, you might be wanting to settle down and start a family Mm -hmm. um, and that's important. And um, the other thing that relates to the question is like kind of, okay, in terms of maybe you want to get really at the coalface of uh, public health and you want to be working in a low and middle income country. uh, Most poor countries have got a huge need. So you could almost look anywhere in the developing world and there's going to be a need for people to kind of get involved. And then then it starts depending very much on like what kind of work would you like to get involved with. So you've got organizations like MSF, you know, that'll parachute you into any kind of disaster area. And, uh, and you know, you, you working with them, you're probably going to move around a lot. Um, it's a very sort of adrenaline-driven career I was actually going to work for the International Committee of the Red Cross in conflict zones when I was finished finishing my MPH I had a job offer from the ICRC to work in in conflict zones and I actually and I'd said yes to the job Mm -hmm. and I and I was going to be moved to the Sudan and at the time there was a there was civil conflict there and I woke up one morning and just kind of genuinely felt afraid. Like I thought I'm going to be going into a very dangerous environment. And then I kind of, I I had this little kind of realization that actually that's, I won't be happy. I won't be comfortable. I'm going to have this feeling. This is how I'm going to feel probably most days when I'm in that working environment. I'm not going to, I'm going to feel unsafe. I'm going to feel unwell. And there's, there are people, and there might be p- people listening to this, this podcast or watching this live stream, that have a very high tolerance of that level of insecurity. I mean, and I've worked with and met people like that, and they like almost thrive on it. And I just had this realization that that wasn't me, and, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Like I, I just had to come to terms with like I can, I'm not one of these people that can just rush off into a conflict zone and feel okay about it. So I phoned them up. And I said, look, I can't take the job. I'm, I'm, I'm. And I actually had that realization while I was on Tottenham Court Road in London shopping for a satellite phone. Like that's how close I was to leaving. Right. I was going to get a satellite mm-hmm. phone and buy a ticket and go. And I just was like, I can't do this. Uh, and and 
funny enough, that very same day, I got phoned up by the, the London School of Hygiene off, and, and they, they, they offered me a job as a clinical research fellow. And I was like, yes, I'm coming to sign <laughs> the papers right now. I'll do that. That's <laughs> what I want to do right now. <laughs> Sounds safe. Um, yeah. So I just kind of took – so um, – so you need to kind of think about what it is you want to do in that developing country context, if that's where you want to work. Uh, you need to think about where you are in your life. Like, are you at the kind of, I want a picket fence and a tree and a dog and a wife and kids? Because um, flying around, uh, you, 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 is, it's dif- it's difficult to, 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 people do it by the way, you know, and, and uh, but it's, I think it's hard. It's hard if you want to start a family and you're bouncing around, um, you know, the field uh, but there are people that do it and and uh, you know obviously there's nothing wrong with that but you gotta you gotta figure out what works for you mm-hmm. yeah um thanks so thank you dr uh, martin i think it's the last point you mentioned about um, individuals well-being and how comfortable they feel with the specific career i think that's that really resonates so yeah. i've often heard and people have also asked me and i've never seemed to have the correct answer or even just where where to begin it's that um you know looking to eventually let's say work in the global health field how important is it really to have those field experience or you know or have international experience or just something along those lines that you're able to or is it like is that something that will you know without it that will um kind of hold you back from a career in global health uh so it it won't hold you back if you don't have field experience because um but it does it depends a lot on exactly what it is your your uh, value proposition is in terms of looking for jobs. So let's say, for example, you're wanting to work, um, you're wanting to work at the WHO in Geneva. If you're applying for a job as a statistician or a data scientist, that's going to be they don't. Nobody really minds whether you've been doing stats in the field or not. For example, if you're uh, wanting to work as a you know as, as, as a health systems expert, particularly with respect to uh, health system strengthening in developing countries, then you absolutely have to have been working in a developing country and seen you know health systems and health system development um, and been at the coalface in that sense. So it depends a lot on what it is that you're wanting to do. But there are so many jobs in the global health space that you could get at sort of a headquarters level, which for which the field experience isn't necessary that you don't need to feel that I can't work in this space unless I go and uh, spend a few years in the field. The exception to that is if you're wanting to be the sort of person that's that that's going to be your value proposition like I'm I'm coming to the table with that, that field experience and I've been you know working at the coalface in that space and um, and having had that experience i can now bring the learning and make a contribution um you know in in, in this in this different environment but it's it i i i um I, I think it really really comes down to the kind of job that you're looking for and the kind of field that you're working in and if it's the case see i think the reason you don't need to worry about it too much is that the, the kinds of people that are interested in the sorts of things that require field experience are the same kinds of people that land up getting the field experience if that makes sense like there's de- there's definitely like a natural source sorting you know what i mean like mm-hmm. the, the kind of person that's like sort of deeply interested in mathematics and statistics and data science and modeling is the kind of person that spends a whole lot of time at you un- like they're just not finding themselves in you know rwanda like that mm. you know and but the jobs that they are applying for also aren't requiring that of them uh, so there's there's almost like a natural sorting like your interests will take you along a path that give you the experience that you need to land up in the place that you're going to find yourself so I don't, like mm. I, people ask that question a lot but i um i think if if don't go and do field experience because you think you have to in order to get some other kind of job go and do field experience go work in the field if that's where your passion is and that will lead you naturally to the kinds of jobs that that kind of experience gets you ready for. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So I kind of think do do the thing that feels right for you. If you don't really feel comfortable, and it's fine to not feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable going to the Sudan, and at the time I actually felt a bit like, oh, is there something wrong with me? Am I not supposed to want to go and do that? But you just come to terms with that. Like, like it's okay not to be that person. Um, 
maybe you've got a family, you want to start a family, or whatever, for, whatever, for whatever reason, if you don't feel comfortable going and doing field experience, you're entitled to to not be that person. There's still space for you to add value in other ways and you'll you know kind of find your space. Awesome. So we have a question from uh, Perva. Her exact question was, um, what are some of the biggest changes in public health or global health you have seen or expect to see over the next few years that impact um, the work in the, in, the, in the coming years? Well, I, like I think one of the things that we, you know, COVID-19 has definitely awakened the world to the seriousness of pandemic threat. And the truth be told, and I, people aren't saying this now, but this is going to have to be a conversation that we have quite soon. And that is that um, nature threw us a very softball with COVID-19. Like this could have been so much worse. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has got a case fatality rate like, you know, that's way down, you know, in and around 1%, depending on where you are. Uh, there are viruses out there that have got a 60% case fatality rate, you know, and, and we need to come to terms with the fact that, like, you know, zoonotic outbreaks with pandemic potential is something we need to be much better prepared for going forward. So the one big change we're going to see, I think, is there's going to be a lot of resources poured into pandemic preparedness, um, that kind of health protection uh, coordinated responses across different countries, making sure that um, we've got ourselves kind of, and, and a lot of what we're doing now in terms of the public health response are going to be consolidated and, and, and kept in play going forwards. So for example, in Ireland, we've got, we've put together quite a sophisticated contact tracing mechanism that we didn't have before COVID-19. I'm pretty sure in some shape or form that mechanism will be kept in place. Mm. It'll be scaled down, but it'll be ready to kind of scale up if needs be. So there'll be a lot, and that's going to have to be manned. There's going to be resources put in place for that. Um, so, so, so that's going to be a big change that we're going to see. That change may have some detrimental effects on other areas of public health because resources will be shuffled from yes. some things into other things. The downside of that is that they, these might be resources that are taken from other streams of work. Um, and we've seen that before. We saw, you know, there was a point in time when there was so much resource being poured into the HIV pandemic that other areas like neglected tropical diseases just remained neglected. Mm-hmm. You know, and when we're still struggling to kind of ensure that there's resources and money and finances put aside and and uh, focused on some of these other issues, non-communicable disease, of course, is important, and that might suffer a little bit with yeah. the sort of increasing prioritization of uh, being able to respond to future pandemics. And I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, I, like it's it's um, it's something we're going to have to come to terms with and figure out as a global health community. And at the same time, though, I think COVID has shown us that a lot of our weaknesses within public health and global health are within the health system. And so, like you were mentioning with contact tracing, that's something that we should already have set up everywhere. So even if it, it pulls resources from some areas, in the long run, it could be a benefit overall because we're strengthening the system. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to have to do it. Like there's no, you know, we... Um, like pandemic, like, like you know, if, if we think about what, let's say, for example, we had um, a virus that had the sort of case fatality rate of this Nipah virus that's flapping around, that's not very infectious, but has got a case fatality rate of 60%. And you had a virus like that, that had the um, R naught of, of measles, which is like every, you know, every every case will infect 16 additional cases in a, in a totally susceptible population. If you had a virus like that flapping around, at the moment when we're on lockdown, um, we've still got essential services working. We've got clean water, we've got electricity, we've got the internet, we can do Skype, we can order things online. With with a serious enough pandemic, all of those things would go away. Like no one would go, they, like society would just start falling apart around us. Uh, you know, the virus wouldn't kill us. We'd, we'd like we, you know, after, after, 48 hours of not having clean water coming out of your taps, people will start looking over the wall to see what their neighbors got and what's going to scare the crap out of them is they'll see their neighbor looking back. The point is, like, we we cannot afford to, like, get to a point where, uh, uh, you know, we get pandemic threats that um, are beyond the scope of our ability to manage them. We're just mm-hmm. going forwards. We've got to take this seriously. Um, and, I, and I don't know what that means in terms of resource, but whatever it is, we just have to put it in place. We have a 
few more questions. If you could answer them very briefly, that would be great. Sure. So the first one is from Zuha. And it's, can you please give insight on how to pursue management, especially if you started with the entry level public health job? So would a PMP, a professional certification in project management be sufficient? Any certificates you can get on any of the different aspects of management will stand you in good stead. Project management's important, human resource management's important, risk management's important, performance management's important, fi- budgets and finances. Any management certificates you can get, get them and then find ways of applying them in your day-to-day life. One last question from Lauren. Any tips for someone who's trying to get into global health from a background in nursing slash hospital management? Um, this individual is currently working on an MPH with a specialty in global health. And uh, Lauren's also interested in health equity and women's health. Okay, well, she's definitely piecing together all the right pieces of the puzzle. Firstly, she's getting the MPH, so she'll have that kind of entry-level education that's needed. When she gets into that public health space, she's got the clinical background, and that counts for a lot. There's a lot of people in global health that don't have that, so she needs to work that angle. When she applies for jobs, she needs to say, I've been at the coal phase of healthcare. That's important. It'll give her a lot of insight into actual health systems because she's really been part of the health system itself. And then the space that she's looking at, did you say uh, uh, gender equity, that kind of thing was at the... Yeah, health right, equity yeah, and women's health, yeah. Super important area. There's loads of work there. She's not going to struggle whatsoever. Thanks again for um, lending us your time. Um, I would imagine a lot of people benefited from hearing about your journey and your expertise. And um, I did as well. So thanks again for coming. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to give you an opportunity as well for any final words around the topics we've been discussing today um even anything words of motivation or insight that you have that you want to um leave us with as well as um you do some great work as well in um communicating about a lot of these topics on your youtube channel and i think learn more 365.com is your website where you also have courses for people who wanted to, to learn about those various aspects of public health and global health so I'll pass it on um, over to you and you can take it however you will. Well, firstly, thanks very much for having me here. This has been a lot of fun. I've loved this. I'll come back anytime you guys ask me. <laughs> this was terrific. Uh, just one thing I'll say to people that are, that are interested in pl- working in the global health space or the public health space is this. You will be saving lives. So when you get up in the morning, you're having a bad day, you're tired, you know, y- y- your work is being feeling a little bit dull. You're saving lives you just don't know who those lives are because public, the word, when public health works, it translates into things that don't happen. People that don't get exposed, people that don't get sick, people that don't land up in the hospital, putting pressure on the acute hospital system. So the work you're doing is saving lives. You just don't know who those lives are. Those people don't know that you've saved their lives. And so they don't know to thank you. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways that thank you process doesn't happen and it's easy to feel a bit disheartened. Like this is just a job and get mm-hmm. into the rut of it. But Don't just keep in the back of your mind there are people alive today that wouldn't be were it not for the work we're doing. Um, And and if you keep that in mind, and I keep that in the back of my mind, and I tell that to my staff and my team that I work with, and I tell it to them often, you know, you guys are saving lives. We don't know who they are. They don't know who they are, but they're alive because of the work you're doing. So so let that motivate you if you can. Absolutely. And uh, share a bit about your, how how do people find um, some of the content that you create? The YouTube channel. So if you go to, um, I think it's youtube.com forward slash Dr. Greg Martin, D R G R E G M A R T. We'll put a link in there as well. I had to think about how to spell my name there. <laughs> uh, that, so that's my YouTube channel. That's the, the pro- I'm on Twitter and I'm on all of the other social media places, but the place I'm most active is YouTube. So that's probably the best place to find me. Um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, learnmore365.com. I, I, I have some teaching content that I sell there but I've got a public health course that's on there that's free so the public health teaching content is free absolutely well thank you so much uh, for joining us again Um, we'll certainly in the next you know end of the year next year at some point um, invite you on there's a lot more we wanted to discuss but we had a really engaged audience who had a lot of questions so um, we're happy that we were able to get through those so in the future again we'd be happy to have you Um, to talk about some more important public health and global health topics. It's been fantastic being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This was amazing. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. 
to learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral.